Um, this week, I'm very pleased to be doing the introduction for a, a number of reasons. One is that I'm also on the board of Cape Cod Art Center, and I know these two lovely ladies very well. And um, they are wonderful. Robert, Roberta has a 23-year career in education as a high school media specialist, information technology expert, and was an adjunct professor at Framingham State College teaching technology courses for educators in the graduate program. While Roberta spent most of her childhood on Cape Cod, her husband, David, and she moved here full time in 2004. She quickly became involved in the Cape Cod Art Center when she moved here. And as it is with the Cape Cod Art Center and probably all nonprofits, <laughs> she became a board member and then she became president of the board and now she's the unpaid executive director. So um, she and I have um, known each other for since 2004, I guess, and I had the pleasure of being with her as the co-grand marshal of the 4th of July parade. So, <laughs> she is a very accomplished photographer and is very active in the Barnesville community, serving on the Long Range Planning Committee, the Barnesville Village Association, and is one of the organizers, or is the organizer of the Barnesville Village Cultural District designation. And she's the creator of the Barnesville Village walking tour map, if you've seen that. Susan Gwill is a retired econo economist, writer, educator, and speaker, and happens to be related to our president of um, Tales of Cape Cod Board, only peripherally. Um, she, began, she began her career as an economist, economist specializing in the application of economic principles to public policy, defining market potential, establishing marketing plans, and implementing strategies to achieve goals. She moved into commercial real estate development, locating and qualifying potential sites across the country using market feasibility studies. She wrote a humor column for Philadelphia newspaper for 16 years, and she is funny. Um, she was also adjunct professor of writing and speaker, and a speaker at workshops and conferences. She and her husband, Jean, retired to Barnesville in 2014. She is currently president of the Cape Cod Art Center and a trustee of the Sturgis Library. Today, they will talk to you about the Cape Cod Art Center and its colorful history and its impact and influence on Cape Cod art. I'm very pleased to present Susan Gill and Roberta Miller. Hello and welcome. Happy to have you here. The Cape Cod Art Center is the nonprofit anchor on the other end of Barnstable Village. We are east of Bacon Farm. We've been in existence for 71 years. We have been on 6A since the 1970s. But I don't imagine that you remember much because we're behind a big embankment. We have to depend on you, your curiosity to come in and see we're there. About a year before our 70th birthday, we thought that we would ask the board how they wanted to celebrate. In a lighthearted moment, one of our board members said, clean out the shed behind the building. <laughs> well, that's the famous shed now. Of all the suggestions from birthday cake to black tie gala, cleaning out that shed was the best thing we could have done for our organization. The shed was filled with boxes of old papers, newspaper clippings, and photos, some 65 years old. We thought it was trash, but one of our members was curious and decided to look into the boxes and see what was there. And she found a treasure trove. We learned our history. We found out all of the things that we needed to know about how the Provincetown art community expanded into the Mid-Cape, and it was because of us. We were a successful cog 
in the history of art and artists on Cape Cod. The boxes contained well-preserved, handwritten, detailed minutes from meetings all through the 1940s about our previous locations, about our founders, uh, about uh, the artists that used to paint at the Cape Cod Art Center, um, at the people who used to teach there. Thanks to underwriting from the Cape Cod Five, we were so thrilled we were able to publish a book and we brought some of those books with us. Today, there are about 25,000 artists on Cape Cod. They all need to learn, they all need to teach, they need gallery space, they need to sell their work. Now that falls right into our mission at the Cape Cod Art Center. We are the largest edu art educator on Cape Cod. We have over a thousand members. Was I supposed to flip yeah, this? Well, that's, okay. that's the book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we have over a thousand members, but we are not a private club. You don't have to be a member to take classes or workshops, to enter our competitions, or to go through our galleries. Our galleries are open every day and they're free, and we'd love to have you. We were the first, and now we're the largest photography center on Cape Cod. And very recently, we started the National Digital Art Association right here in Barnstable Village. We teach night, day, weekends, seven days a week, 12 months a year, to all ages and all abilities. We, our in-house and our online competitions draw entries from around the world. We hang 15 exhibits a year. We are not a museum. We do not keep any artwork in a permanent collection. Everything changes 15 times a year. We have volunteers who do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> we award thousands of dollars a year in prizes. And each one of our exhibits uh, has an opening reception. You're all invited. It's always free. We'd love to have you. Our annual high school show hosts the finest artists, high school artists, across the Cape of all 15 high schools, chosen by their teachers. We have, again, a reception for them, and they can't drink wine, so we have pizza. But they are also getting prize money. We have a poster contest every year. I'm supposed to be flipping here. <laughs> we have a poster contest every year for lower and middle school students, and they don't even have to qualify. All posters are accepted. And again, we have a reception for them. There are cash awards, and they get pizza. Our 18th annual Art in the Village was the last weekend of, there we go, was the last weekend in June. Um, we produce two annual conferences. One is Mastering Your Mark for easel artists. That's just in a couple of weeks. We do Click for photographers, which is later in the fall. And hopefully you were able to visit our pop-up art sale this summer uh, during the month of August in Barnstable Village. We have a new one. Barnstorming. There are lots of barns in Barnstable, and we have started a, um, hope we, we hope will be an annual event, bringing the barns back to Barnstable. Seven owners of barns have given us permission to have people on site, photographers, painters, um, you can use crayons, you don't have to be an artist, you can just come in for the day. It's a day-long event. We have, this is October 5th. We have people coming in during the day to do uh, the artwork, paint, photograph. Hopefully they will take their work back to the art center at the end of the day and we will auction it 
that night. There'll be lots of delicious food and a lot of fun. We hope you'll come. It's open to everyone. We would love to have you. Um, where did we come from and why are we here? Provincetown started a revolution well over 100 years ago as New York artists began to gravitate from New York to the Cape and to the Outer Cape in particular. They went there for the same reasons we do, the novelty, uh, the beautiful light, and the dynamic color. Provincetown became a summer mecca for artists, but they still needed camaraderie. They needed to be able to um, sell their work. They needed galleries. So in 1914, a group of Provincetown artists got together and started the Providence, Providence, Provincetown Art Association and Museum. You might know it as PAM. Some of the seasonal and year-round artists were locating further and further away from Provincetown, and it was difficult for them to get to PAM. Uh, this was, remember, back in the 20s and the 30s, and um, roots, there probably was a Route 6 back then, but it wasn't nearly as nice as it is now. Um, so the artists in the Mid-Cape decided to join, and in 1948, they started the Cape Cod Art Association here in, in Barnstable, in the, town of Barnes, in the town of Barnstable, to fill the void for the Mid-Cape artists. One thing we know is that the Cape Cod Art Center has been an integral part of the history of art and artists on Cape Cod. And now my, my, Roberta Miller is going to take you through. <laughs> my colleague, I couldn't remember the word. My colleague, Roberta Miller, is going to take you through the history of art. Thank you, Susan, and thank you all for being here. And um, I, I really, this is my first time uh, speaking to this uh, auspicious group, and I, I'm happy to be here. So it's my job to take you back in history to tell you about uh, the art scene on Cape Cod. Uh, it really started in the early 1900s, as Susan has uh, said. Artist Charles Hawthorne lived in New York City, city but he summered in Provincetown. And there he founded the Cape Cod School of Art so that he could start teaching all of those people that he was working with in New York. Um, after a while, they felt that there were so many artists that they should get together and uh, have a building. So in 1914, as Susan said, the Provincetown Art Association was founded. And uh, the Cape Cod School of Art was the first outdoor summer school for figure painting and grew into one of the nation's leading art schools. At his school, Hawthorne gave weekly criticisms and instructive talks, guiding his pupils in setting up ideals, but never imposing his own technique or method. So here they are on a pier and he's showing them how he is framing out the picture and they're all sitting, sitting and uh, painting with him. So artists he met in New York City heard about the Provincetown School and traveled to the Cape every summer, some of whom stayed permanently. The artist colony there grew and many galleries started opening. At the age of 17, artist Henry Henchy began to work in Chicago. Oh, this, this is an example of some of Hawthorne's work. As you can see, his, uh, his uh, uh, landscapes uh, almost look impressionistic. Uh, they have a Monet style to them. Um, and uh, he was very popular at that time. He also uh, worked hard at doing some portraits as well. But Henchy, Henchy came to the Cape 
Uh, he started out in Chicago, uh, working at the Art Institute in Chicago, and he studied the old masters and their techniques, but was drawn to the work of the Impressionists, which were on exhibit. Several students at the Institute have previously studied with Charles Hawthorne and said to him, why not go to the Cape and learn from him? So Henshi admired their techniques and decided to travel to P-Town. And by the summer of 1919, Henry Henshi uh, was there and uh, Charles Hawthorne was his mentor. He embraced Hawthorne's color note approach to painting. After Charles Hawthorne died, Henshi began to teach on his own in Provincetown. He took over the Cape Cod School of Art. His work as both a painter and teacher was to advance the ideals of color. And as you can see uh, on the right, the uh, still life is very colorful. Uh, we'll go, that, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, his work uh, as, was opposed to tonal painting. He was interested in cr creating visual poetry in the tradition of Claude Monet. And while advancing that art movement, the true progression of art was there for Henshi. By the end of the 1930s, there were hundreds of artists on the Cape, most living in Pitan. But others were cropping up throughout the whole Cape. During the Depression, President Roosevelt, under the New Deal, started the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. This was a public works agency that funded the visual arts as well as music, uh, poetry, literature in the United States. It was created not as a cultural activity, but as a relief measure to employ artists to create murals, easels, uh, easel paintings, sculpture, graphic art, posters, photography, theater, scenic design, and arts and crafts. The WPA had established more than 100 community art centers throughout the country, researched and documented American design, commissioned a significant body of public art without restriction to content or subject matter, and sustained some 10,000 artists and craft workers during the Great Depression as they were all paid by the government. Vernon Coleman was one of those people that were hired by the WPA. Vernon was put to work to paint murals. In the town hall in Hyannis, if you walk through the front door and up the stairs, there is this beautiful mural. It is called the Red Jacket, and it was uh, captained by Asa Eldridge in Yarmouth. And I understand that you had a lecture here about Asa Eldridge as well. He ranked uh, among the largest and fastest clipper ships ever built. The artist captured that sense of speed and strength as the ship seems to surge forward, regardless of where the viewer stands. Um, Coleman grew up in the Cape, in Hyannis. His family went back to the 1600s. They, uh, they had uh, ships and seascapes uh, for, their favorite, for his favorite subject. During the Great Depression, he qualified for Roosevelt's project, supervised regionally by Orleans artist Vernon Smith. From 1934 to 43, Coleman created over 100 paintings and murals. Other murals may be found in the Pope John II Catholic High School in Hyannis, in a building on the corner of Pearl and South Street, which is part of the High Arts District, the Centerville Recreation Building on Main Street, and Osterville's Historical Society Boathouse on West Bay Road. Recently, you may have seen in the paper, uh, a hamburger uh, restaurant opened on Main Street called Kaka Kakadies. And uh, while they were decorating that restaurant, they exposed in the wall several of Vernon Coleman's uh, murals. Uh, and uh, they were actually going to cover them up. And so an awful lot of uh, artists, you know, took, took 
arms and said, you can't do that, these are famous murals, we can't let this go. So they eventually cut them out of the wall and donated them to the Cape Cod Museum of Art and Dennis uh, so that they could retain the um, structure of them and the beauty of them. So that, that was a really good thing. Um, cultural artifacts of the era populate his paintings. I'll show you some of his other paintings. This is one of his seascapes because he liked um, doing seascapes and lighthouses. But he also painted telephone poles, storefronts, jalopies, fishing draggers, cat boats, um, and he was very popular at the time. In 1943, Coleman became uh, a teacher at the uh, Art uh, of Art in Barnstable School System and uh, then became the director of art. Um, in 1948, he was one of the first members to join the Cape Cod Art Association. We'll go on to the next slide. So since Provincetown had the largest concentration of artists on the Cape, a group of artists in the Mid-Cape area under the leadership of famous Mass General Hospital pediatrician Dr. Fritz Talbot, who had a house in Osterville, decided it would be more convenient to exhibit and educate other artists in Hyannis. Thus, the Cape Cod Art Association was incorporated as a nonprofit art center in Hyannis in 1948. Actually, he was the mentor to Dr. Barry Brazelton, who is, was a very good little artist. And he, when I joined the Art Association, he, um, he came over and took classes with us as well. Uh, and he was probably in his late 80s at that point. Um, so the Art Association was uh, in Hyannis in 1948, and uh, they were, uh, there were many artists who joined, and I'm going to give you an idea of, uh, of what their artwork looked like. But first I'm going to talk a little about Dr. Talbot. He gave its members the chance to exchange ideas, exhibit, and sell their work and bring educational programs to the Mid-Cape area. He had a dream for the new organization's future. He hoped, and I quote, to establish a center which would eventually include all of the arts and set an example of what can be done in a semi-rural community. So here are some of the earliest members. Uh, but at first I want to talk a little bit about what is art. Uh, because I think it means something to everyone. So when you look at something, uh, you interpret it in your own way, how you see it. And um, artists do the same thing. They like to convey what they are seeing to their public. And so it's a matter of interpretation, whether or not you like what they are seeing, they, you like what they're interpreting, and how they want to show you uh, what is in front of them. So here are some of the artists that started the Art Association with Dr. Talbot. And as you can see, Dr. Talbot was a painter as well. He liked to do landscapes. Vernon Smith was one of the early people in the, in the 1930s who developed an antique style of painting. He used oil glaze over gessoed hard board, and he scratched and scraped the surface of wet paint to create the highlights. So in this particular piece, uh, this is about the fishing industry. If you can see the nets, here is a fisherman. These are buoys. Uh, he's got boats in there. So he conveys uh, what the seafaring life was like, but his interpretation, I don't know, do you like it? This is pretty um, abstract in its best um, and maybe in, it, in its worst. I don't know, it's up to you. He ended up uh, starting to, oops, starting to etch um, uh, wood. Uh, and as you can see, uh, he did become very abstract in his, in his work. 
he liked to use basic earth tones, and that's why I think the wood lends it itself better to what he was trying to show in those uh, colors. Next is William Littlefield, and I guess the abstract bug caught on because he too was an abstract artist. Uh, he used a lot of color and a lot of shading. Um, here is his idea of a portrait. Uh, again, uh, it looks very uh, realistic in terms of that you know it's a figure, but it's also very uh, abstract in its uh, work. Elliot Orr, on the other hand, really did a lot of landscapes, and he was really well known for the beautiful skies here on Cape Cod. Painters are attracted to Cape, the Cape because of its beauty of light and its beauty of color, and it really shows in the sky, especially during sunrise and sunset. But Elliot also liked to do nighttime work, and, and, and so you can't see the beauty of the sky there, but you know it's there. Chester Slack uh, also did some uh, landscapes. You could tell the beach path goes right to the ocean. It's, it's what he actually saw when he was at the beach in front of him. Uh, and I think he did a great job of conveying his scene. Um, he also did a self-portrait. This is Chester. So, as I talked about before, Henry Henschy and Hoffman also joined the Art Association. Uh, they were excited that it opened in the 40s because it gave them another place to exhibit, it gave them another place to teach, it gave them another place to have uh, camaraderie with other artists and to uh, meet artists uh, that were all throughout the Cape. Uh, Henschy was well known for his light uh, highlighting everything in this painting. You see the highlights on the shoulders and in her face. She comes alive. Uh, that was his style. Uh, Hoffman, on the other hand, uh, again, did a lot of abstract work, but uh, it was filled with color and very bright color at that. Sam Barber, I don't know if any of you have met Sam or know Sam. Sam Barber was born in Naples, Italy. He came to Provincetown through New York City, and then he moved to Kamaquid and opened a studio in the 70s. I have heard that the post office in Yarmouth Port in Kamaquid was his studio, but I haven't been able to really confirm that, but people have told me that. Uh, but Sam is quite a character. He's still uh, painting. Um, he used to live in um, uh, Hyannisport, right on the pier, and you saw this beautiful uh, stone lance, uh, lighthouse on the, on the point. That was Sam's property, and his, uh, his studio was in the lighthouse, so it was uh, quite a beautiful site for him. Sam uh, is well known for his bright, bright color and he has a very impressionistic style. And if you go to his studio now, you will see the same types and styles of um, impressionistic paintings. Um, uh, and he's, he is uh, still painting, as a matter of fact, and very productive. His canvases are shown in New York City and some of them are uh, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars each. The next person that had joined as an early uh, member was Donald Stuckey. I don't know if anybody knows Don, but uh, he also did uh, representation of boats, believe it or not, uh, but in, again in a very abstract style. Um, he loved the elements of boats and he became a boat builder and now is at the Maritime Museum in Hyannis in the boat building shop, putting boats together and teaching people how his craft uh, is. Um, he's, it's a very popular uh, program over there. Henri Brenou, again, another uh, European artist, found his way to the Cape. 
um, and he uh, became one of our teachers. And he was using uh, layers uh, with a brush, but he also started using a palette knife, which puts gobs of paint on the canvas uh, that you can stretch out and uh, make an emphasis in it so that it shows some depth. Uh, so he was one of the first ones who started capturing the light and the shadow in his pieces. Romanus Risk, obviously another European, but it, one of Provincetown's most prominent artists. He has an international reputation um, for his abstracts. He had a very Zen philosophy, uh, and he wanted all his abstracts to show the one with Tao, which is part of their philosophy. So that, that's uh, Risk. Xavier Gonzalez is also internationally known. He was born in Spain and uh, came to Provincetown as well. Isn't it interesting that all of these people end up in this little town called Provincetown and become famous artists? But that's exactly what happened. Uh, and they really made a name for themselves, but uh, had a very large reputation. More contemporary is Harry Hall, and I'm sure that most of you recognize Harry's name. He opened a pottery shop called the Scargo Pottery Shop in Dennis on Scargo Lake, and he taught many people his uh, craft of pottery. As a matter of fact, he mentored Kevin Nolan at the Barnstable Pottery Shop. He was his teacher, uh, and he was really uh, a wonderful artist. He did get into abstract uh, work as well, uh, but his reputation was mostly uh, through his pottery. Um, he uh, was very instrumental in keeping our uh, educational program going at the Art Association, but he also felt that there was uh, a, this was the place and time to start something bigger, so he was the one who uh, started the Cape Cod Museum of Art with a group of people because they felt that a permanent collection should be started uh, of Cape Cod artists because they were becoming so well known and uh, they needed another place to uh, explore and uh, have exhibits so uh, he was uh, really instrumental in helping with that. Martha and Ralph Cahoon, again, another popular uh, twosome of artists. Their ancestors settled in Chatham in the 1700s, and they were whalers and fishermen. Both he and Martha became furniture and antique dealers, as well as painters, and they resided uh, finally in Catuit uh, after living in Chatham. Um, here is a picture of the couple. Um, Martha was the one that loved to paint furniture. So she taught Ralph. She said, don't use those canvases. Let's start painting on tables. And uh, they would collect the antique tables and put their folk art uh, pieces on furniture, which was really well received. Uh, their historic home became the Cahoon Museum of American Art, which holds a large collection of their famous folk art. And you can see it, depict, it still depicts Cape Cod scenes, sailors, visitors, uh, ships, um, hot air balloons, I suppose they saw that some, at some point over the water. So they're very popular. So in 1970, the owner of uh, the um, Bacon Farm donated part of their land to the Cape Cod Art Association. Uh, we were, had a gallery in Hyannis, and they said, you know, why don't you come over to um, the village? And uh, their land, obviously, it was part of the old uh, fairgrounds in Barnstable, the yellow condos that are next door to us was part of it as well. So the uh, idea of 
moving to the village was very popular because they liked the idea that uh, they would have their own home. So by 1970, they moved to Barnstable Village into a barn while they were building uh, the present building. Um, the group hired a well-known local architect, Richard Sears Gallagher. Uh, I don't know if any of you know him, but he was from the village. Um, he designed our modernistic building. Um, fortunately, Old King's Highway Department wasn't in existence at that point, or they would not have been happy. But uh, he was known for building modern homes. This happens to be, uh, on the right, uh, Parker's River Liquor Store, which I think is now on Route 132, but that was a modern building as well. And I was told that uh, he built five or six modern-looking homes here in the village, um, and, and they're, st they're still uh, being occupied. So, um, so that was good. We moved into the village in 1972, and, and the, uh, it was built as a summer gallery. It was built without heat or air conditioning, without insulation, but a lot of windows. And the exhibits ran on a regular basis throughout the year, and so did its educational program. Um, but as you can see, on hot days, they would go outside, this is outside of our building, um, and set up their easels and paint together. You know, uh, artists uh, really is a, a very lonely profession. You sit in your studio all by yourself, some, some people from morning to night, and they paint alone, and it gets to the point that they really need to have uh, other people criticizing their work, other people suggesting what they should be doing and improving their work. So that's why they would gravitate to the art center so that they would have other artists with them uh, painting with them. So, uh, so they were all outside together. So um, I, I'd like to show you uh, a couple of uh, pictures from the early days. Obviously, they're only black and white. But um, this picture up here, again, was a class working together in one of our studios. Um, this is uh, one of the board members uh, giving an award to a, a student who, uh, who uh, did a, a painting. And again, a group of people that were working together. But it was uh, a lot of camaraderie and a lot of people from Provincetown ended up coming to the Mid-Cape area as well as those people in the Mid-Cape area going to Provincetown. So it worked out really nicely. So we had some uh, other exhibiting artists uh, in the 70s and 80s who joined. Um, I talked about uh, Henri Brenu. He uh, was well known for his uh, seascapes. He always put a lone boat in his paintings. Uh, Frederick Johnson also uh, loved to do seascapes. It was a very popular topic uh, uh, of those days. Vivian Oswell, uh, just recently, maybe a year ago, passed away in her 90s, but this was her last painting. She was still painting uh, really, really well, um, and she paid attention to a lot of uh, light coming through the window. Uh, I love the detail of the gossamer-looking curtains. It really was a tremendous uh, amount of work to do that detail work. Um, Suzanne Howe Stevens, she also just recently passed away. Um, and her works are still being sold in a gallery on Commercial Street in Provincetown. She had a very unique style. This is a board of wood. And she, I don't know if you could see it, but this is the map of Florida that she put in the background. And then the scene that she painted showed what was in the map, from an area in the map. So she did a beautiful uh, rendition of a, of a river there. 
Uh, but then, it, interestingly enough, she showed the lushness of the, the greenery by including it in what she considered the frame of the piece, because her pieces are not framed like you normally would see. That's the whole piece when you hang it on the wall. So it was just an interesting concept of how she created her artwork. Here's Sam Barber, uh, as he is today. He loves to wear suspenders, um, but you can see in the background all of his work uh, is impressionistic style. And uh, as I said, he, he is very, very popular. Carol Wyckoff, again in her late 80s, she does camp, uh, paintings uh, with watercolor and is very, very popular. And she's a very philanthropic woman. She, every year she does a very, very large painting and donates it to the Rotary Club in Hyannis. And they sell tickets to raffle the painting away, but that amount of money that they make from the raffle, they give out to uh, high school students uh, for scholarships uh, to Barnstable High School. She always feels that she should give back to her teachers and this is the way she does it. And so uh, it, it's, it's uh, really, really nice of her because she really creates beautiful canvases. Uh, if you come into the Arts Center, uh, we're having a reception on Thursday night, by the way, from 5 to 7. Uh, you will see one of her pieces that she just did of, um, of the Hyannis Harbor and Baxter's Fish Wharf. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And that's the next piece that's going to the Rotary Club for her raffle. Robert Douglas Hunter, uh, a very famous um, land, um, still life painter, was the husband of Elizabeth Hunter, who was the director of the Cape Cod Museum of Art. That's probably how you know his name. But he uh, painted on the Cape an awful lot and, and taught at the Art Association as well. Marie Louise Hutchinson uh, is approaching 90. She's uh, uh, still painting. Her, her forte is this miniature, detailed uh, image of houses and barns. A lot of them are in Vermont, where she has another home. But a lot of them are here on the Cape. And as you can see, the detail, she has a reef on the door. She's got something hanging in the window if you look closely to it. Uh, but she uses very, very tiny, tiny brushes. She threw a magnifying glass to paint uh, this piece. Um, and uh, she's just a fabulous, fabulous artist. And she too gives back. She always designs a Christmas card for the Aetna Insurance Company, uh, which they sell and give the money away to um, needy people. So I think it's just a wonderful thing for an artist to do. Christy Velesig uh, is um, from Barnstable. She does a lot of boats. Uh, she's known for her boats. She, uh, this happens to be an oil painting, but she also paints watercolors, uh, and you can see a lot of her pieces on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, but she, for a long time, was the most popular teacher we have ever had. Uh, they would stand in line just to sign up to get in there, but we only had a limited amount of space, so they used to fight to get into her class. Uh, lastly, Susie McLean O'Brien, <laughs> Uh, she's originally from Australia, but uh, somehow she ended up on the Cape. Um, she's represented by galleries in Osterville. Uh, she does oil paintings, but her signature is children. She loves to do children. She loves to do them at the beach, at play, whatever, but it's uh, a delightful subject. So she does really well, but she's been a very longtime member uh, and a, a, good, uh, a good artist. So that's it for the famous artists that uh, are uh, painting with us right now. Our hope for the future is to um, increase our amount of educational space. We're adding two studios, I hope, and also an elevator that will go up the shaft to the third floor, and the third floor will turn into a 
uh, photography and digital art studio as well. So we're hoping we're, we're at the tail end of our capital campaign and we're hoping to build sometime uh, in the next year or so. So, and I think that's, that's all I have. Uh, Susan wants to conclude. <clears throat> We want to thank you for inviting your neighbor to come in and introduce itself. And it just so happens that I told you that we hang 15 exhibits a year, and it just so happens that Thursday we are hanging a new exhibit, and it's open to the public. The wonderful thing about it is it's called My Happy Place. So you're all invited. It's free. There's wine, food. Enjoy yourself. And it's, please introduce yourselves. We'd like to show you around. Thanks very much. Are there any questions that we could take? <laughs>